<laughs> and I said, good evening. That was wrong. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation with Vinya Lin Lee, Beginning Vegetable Gardening. I'm Brenda Harrington, the program librarian at the Belfast Free Library. We are pleased to co-sponsor the daytime lecture series with the Belfast Garden Club this year and glad we can do so remotely. Thank you all for joining us. Before I turn the mic over to Cor Corliss Davis from the Belfast Garden Club, I want to remind everyone to keep your mics muted. Okay, Corliss, take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Brenda. We always want to start our introductions by thanking Brenda and the, and the Belfast Free Library for hosting all of our programs. She's been a great technical and moral support all year. Um, and we want to remind you that the Garden Club's third and last winter evening program for this winter will be one week from today, March 23rd at 6.30, also by Zoom, of course. Our speaker will be Ann Perkins, who is going to be talking about her large market garden in Owl's Head. And she, following up on Vina, will be providing information to both intermediate and advanced vegetable gardeners. You can register for that program at belfastgardenclub.org. The Garden Club is also one of four co-sponsors of the Belfast Bay Watershed's Brown Tail Moth Program coming up on Thursday, March 25th at 6.30 via Zoom. That program we have just learned is almost full. So if there are 300 some people who have registered for it already. So if you'd like to, to uh, take advantage of what you can learn about brown tail moths, you can register for that program at belfastbaywatershed.org slash programs. And Garden Club members are urged to attend our monthly membership meeting beginning at 1.30 today. A separate Zoom link has already been sent out for that meeting. So uh, as Brenda said, I think, please put any questions you have for Vina in the chat. And my co-chair of the program committee, Margaret Campbell, will be reading the questions to Vina at the end of her presentation. So today's speaker is Vina Lindley from the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Office for Waldo County. Vina has a background in education and has been teaching about growing, harvesting, and preserving foods with the Cooperative Extension Service for eight years. She's an avid home gardener, a, and her one of her favorite things to grow is garlic, and she enjoys sharing her passion for gardening with others. I think we are about to get a demonstration of that. So go ahead, Vina. All right, thank you so much. Um, at the risk of sounding repetitive, I just wanna thank the Belfast Garden Club and the Belfast Free Library for hosting me today. Uh, and to all of you for joining at, at your lunch hour. Um, really and truly, there's no other way that I would rather spend my time than in a garden. So in the wintertime, being able to talk about gardening is a really close second. So I'm excited to share with you a little bit about um, getting started with a vegetable garden. I'm hoping there's something in here, something in this talk for all of you. Um, but for me to get a little bit of a sense of who is joining today, I'm hoping to launch a, a quick poll to find out from you whether you are planning to um, start a garden this year or if you are already gardening. So you should be seeing on your screen a little pop-up window that I hope you'll um, weigh in on whether you're starting a garden, whether you've had a garden, or whether you are um, a veteran gardener. And I'm seeing you all uh, putting, your, putting your answers in there, so that's great. Just a few more seconds and we'll... All right, so... I'm going to move this poll box over. Um, so it looks like most of you are veteran gardeners. That's, um, that's great. I hope that this won't be too much of an intro for you all, but we do have a few people who are hoping to get started with gardening, which is very exciting. And some folks who've maybe um, had a garden last year and are looking to learn more. So. That is terrific. Thank you so much. That gives me a good um, idea of who's joining. So um, 
as I said, I, uh, or as uh, Corliss said, I work for the University of Maine Cooperative Extension um, here in Waldo County. And the mission of Humane Extension is to help Maine people improve their lives through an educational process that uses research-based knowledge focused on, on issues and needs in the community. And our educational programs include food systems and youth development programming. So that's uh, anything in commercial ag, home horticulture, food preservation, nutrition, um, food security, and then our youth development program is the 4-H program. So I program in um, home horticulture, but also in food preservation and food safety. Uh, one of our probably most well-known programs is the Master Gardener program. I do see that there are some Master Gardeners joining today, so um, thank you all for hopping on. Uh, the Master Gardener Volunteer Program is a great option if you get into gardening and you really want to dig in and learn more, um, as well as share your knowledge. That's a program where um, we train people in home horticulture and then they go out into their communities to give back. So we're just starting uh, this year's program and it's never too early to get on the uh, wait list to be notified when our program opens up next year. So you'll see at the end of the slideshow, there's a link to do that if you're interested. So let's, let's dig on in. So I'm going to give you t seven um, kind of tips for success in the garden. Um, and the first one is really to try to give your plants the best fighting chance they can get right from the start. Gardening's a lot of work, so in order for you to at least have some success, planning is, is really going to be um, helpful. So for those folks who are uh, haven't installed a garden yet or are thinking about gardening, figuring out where to do so is the biggest decision that you'll make. So in terms of a location, if you're thinking about getting started with a new garden, you want to choose a spot that will get at least six to eight hours of sunlight for your warm season crops. Those are the things that we eat the, um, if you think of things that we eat the fruit of, um, or at least four to six hours of sun for cooler season crops. Those are the plants that we tend to eat the leaves of. Um, you also want to choose a site that is uh, easy for you to get to. Um, the more often you're able to visit your garden, the better you will do at keeping up with um, scouting for pests, uh, harvesting, watering, all of those things that will make or break your garden. In terms of water, uh, we really do have to often provide supplemental waters through the growing season. So choosing a location that's, um, that you don't have to haul water would be ideal. Obviously, there's not always, um, there's always compromises when you're choosing your garden location, but those are some of the things to look for. And some of the things to really avoid um, would be shade from buildings, trees, or other vegetation. Trees that are close by can also compete with your garden for nutrients and water. Those um, roots of the trees, if you think about the crown of the tree, the roots go out um, as far or further than the branches of the trees. So, um, <clears throat> so you want to avoid planting particularly near to trees. Um, but sometimes, so you're looking for an open area you're looking around and sometimes the most open area is your septic leach field which is really not a place to put a garden leach fields are designed only for grass growing on them so even if this is your sunniest spot don't be tempted to plant there additionally if you know that an area tends to get um, flooded or Perhaps you often see deer in a particular area. You'll want to look elsewhere for a place to plant. So once you've um, figured out where it is that you want to place your garden, 
you're going to want to think about what type of garden you want to grow. There's traditional in-ground um, gardens, which could be um, rows or even uh, you're creating sort of uh, raised beds without sides. Some of the benefits to doing a traditional um, in-ground garden would be that you don't have to bring in soil, you don't have to um, buy a lot of uh, materials like lumber, but they can be time consuming and um, pretty labor consuming to build those. And they also tend to be weedier, especially in the first, um, in the first few years. So some people will opt for raised beds instead. Uh, some of the pros to that would be that they, they're almost like an instant garden. You build them and you're ready to go. They're pretty easy to use, particularly, um, you know, if you have uh, back issues or um, challenges with bending, uh, raised beds can be really nice for those reasons. They look great, I think. Um, and uh, you will also find that they tend to have fewer pest um, and environmental issues uh, like early frosts. So some of the cons to raised beds are obviously that you have to bring in a lot of materials like lumber or whatever you're going to build the sides with, as well as soil and compost. You'll find that they also need more watering and they'll need to be maintained over time. If you can't find a spot for either an in-ground garden or raised beds, you might consider containers. Containers are great because they're less expensive. They are helpful if you really only have a patio or a small backyard. Um, and you can really use almost anything as a container. Anything with good drainage can be um, used for container gardening. But you will need to water them very frequently. Um, often you'll need to water container gardens on a daily basis. Uh, they need, you need to plant into a soilless media in a container gardening that needs to be replaced every year. And there's some limits to what uh, varieties of plants will grow well in a container garden. So what if you don't have the ideal spot? You really can't find a sunny place that's not in a leach field, or you just don't want a container garden, you might want to consider community gardening. Community gardening is a great way to get started without having to build or purchase anything. In general, it's a very cost effective way to get started with gardening, and you can meet and learn from other gardeners. So if you live in Belfast, the Wales Park Community Garden is accepting applications for this growing season now through uh, the 19th. So if you are interested in applying for a spot in that garden, it's a beautiful location, really awesome gardeners growing there. Um, and there's a link here to uh, apply for, uh, uh, for a garden bed in the Wales Park Community Garden. So, We've figured out where we're going to garden. Now we want to figure out what to grow. So first off, you want to grow things that you actually enjoy eating. I, um, I am guilty of growing things every year that I don't necessarily love to eat. Radishes are one that we grow, and I find myself um, composting big overgrown radishes every year. So. Really, as you're choosing, you want to choose things that um, you love to eat. When I decide to dedicate time and limited space to growing things, uh, some of the things I think about first are taste. Nothing compares, uh, for example, to peas straight off the vine. Because of the limited uh, time and space, I also weigh the cost of buying a crop versus growing my own. Potatoes, for example, are relatively inexpensive and they're readily available year round from local farmers. So instead, I focus on growing things like herbs, greens, tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant that would be a lot more expensive. Some things to think about are also your space. Do you tend to get an early frost? Is your garden dry or is it wet? These factors will help you decide 
whether to grow warm or cool season crops. If you're a brand new gardener, you might want to focus on tried and true options like green beans, summer squash, uh, or zucchini that tend to be really bountiful and um, a high likelihood for success your first time around. Um, if you anticipate that pests or diseases might be an issue for you, some crops tend to be a little bit less attractive to pests. Those are things with like a strong taste like radishes, um, onions, or garlic. And if you need some help uh, determining how much to plant of each of these crops, you should check out the resources section at the end of this for a fun um, planting calculator. So once you've narrowed down to what crop or crops you want to grow, you can opt for different varieties of seeds. Different varieties are bred for different traits, like a giant pumpkin or a tiny eggplant. Some varieties have varying degrees of disease or pest resistance. So if you know that you really want to grow basil, but you've had issues with something like downy mildew, uh, you'll want to look for a variety with disease resistance to downy mildew. You might also choose varieties based on how long it will take to get them to mature, especially if you're gardening in an area prone to early frost. And lastly, if you're thinking about saving seeds, be sure to choose open pollinated or heirloom varieties because a lot of the seeds sold in seed catalogs are hybrids and those won't um, grow true to type. So if you're going to be installing a garden in a spot that was previously lawn, a couple of other things to think about um, would be that in a, in a new garden that was previously lawn, you don't want to try to grow anything that's direct seeded um, or has small seeds. So your lettuces and carrots um, just won't be able to compete with the weeds. You can try to use some uh, plastic mulch in a place that was previously lawn to help keep weeds down, uh, but really using uh, large seeded crops or transplants is the best approach to um, planting in a new garden that was lawn before. And um, you do want to avoid planting potatoes into previously grown sod. There's some issues with potatoes that um, you want to avoid for at least a year after lawn. So, um, when would you get started with uh, your gardening endeavors? The first thing to kind of think about with, with deciding when to plant what is your frost-free date. So there are several sources for finding your frost-free date. Um, just remember that this is just a best approximation based on past data. So you want to keep an eye on the long-range weather forecast when deciding what to plant. In general, I tend to err on the side of caution, and I find that crops will really catch up if they're planted a little bit later, but they'll never catch up if they're killed by a frost. So the way that frost-free dates are calculated, um, they'll often be shown as 10% likelihood that um, we'll have another frost, or sorry, 10% likelihood that we won't have a frost, 50% likelihood that we won't have a frost, or 90% likelihood that we won't have a frost. Um, so that's that window that you see there, the average frost-free date. Um, and so you can kind of um, decide how much of a risk or gamble you want to take um, in determining when to um, plant your plants in the garden. Um, if you're going to start seeds at home, either um, seeds that you're going to grow as seedlings or seeds directly into the garden, some of the things that you want to um, look at are the days to maturity. So 
days to maturity are listed right should be listed right on your seed packet and you can use that to count back to your last um, to your last frost date to know when to plant them um, for seedlings we're usually looking to start seedlings somewhere between 4 to 12 weeks before the frost date in order for them to be ready to go out into the garden the seed packet should tell you should have that information on it um, unless it's a plant that is somewhat tolerant of frost in that case um, they may be able to go out before um, before the la before the last frost date but if you um, if you end up going with starting seeds at home probably the most important thing to know is that they will need supplemental light so I've seen too many people um, wanting to start their own seedlings and placing them on a nice sunny windowsill and ending up with seedlings that are leggy they're weak they just don't end up um, performing well because they've been stressed from um, early on so having some um, good lighting over over your plants um, is really key to success there we have a publication that I had linked at the end of this for a lot more information on starting your own seedlings uh, so some some plants are uh, we tend to grow as transplants others we can um, have a little bit more it's a little more of a gray area so since we have fewer than 150 days between frosts, our warm season crops really need a head start to bear fruit. So those are your tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, squashes. Um, those are all going to need to be started as, um, or transplanted into the garden. Um, then some of the things that are a little bit more optional, whether you start them as seedlings or you direct seed them would be your squashes, anything in the broccoli family, lettuce, cucumber, and corn can all either be transplanted or um, direct seeded. And then there are a few things that really just do better planted directly into the garden. And those are things like peas and beans, radishes, carrots and parsnips, and anything that easily or um, readily self sows so why would you use um, transplants starting with transplants buys us six to eight weeks of frost free growing time which when you think about the fact that we have about 21 weeks of frost free time here in Maine that's pretty substantial we can also help our plants stand up more easily to pests if they're transplanted versus direct seeded. And some plants are, are most at risk or um, the tastiest to pests when they're in their very early stages. Seedlings also have a way of catching up if they're planted late, but there's again nothing you can do if they're killed by frost. So I do uh, really tend to err on the side of caution when I'm transplanting. Uh, whether you start your own seedlings or purchase them is really up to you, but in my experience, seedling production requires a lot of upfront investment. Um, lights, seedling trays or stands, uh, greenhouse, growing media, all of these things take up a lot of um, valuable space and um, resources. So at least as you're getting started with gardening, I recommend that you purchase your seedlings from a greenhouse or a local farmer um, until you kind of learn um, learn how to be successful in the garden before you get started with starting seedlings on your own. So once you've purchased or grown your seedlings, you don't want to just throw them into the garden as soon as you possibly can. You want to sort of introduce them gradually outside. Remember, they've had a pretty cushy lifestyle up until now. They've either been indoors or in a greenhouse where there really isn't wind or 
major temperature variations. So you want to harden transplants by moving them in and out over the course of a few days, uh, gradually building up to transplanting them. If you can, when you go to plant them into the garden, you want to choose a day that's cool and cloudy. Um, and if they steam really root bound, that's when the roots are um, uh, tightly packed in the little growing containers that they're in, you want to just get loosen, loosen those up gently when you're planting them and always, always water them immediately and continue watering regularly for at least a week or two after they've been transplanted. All right, so step two, you want to feed your plants. So you've chosen what to grow and where to grow it. Now you're going to want to think about, um, about giving your plants what they need to thrive. So rather than feeding your plants, I really want you to think about feeding the soil instead of the plants. What I mean by that is that if you feed your soil by adding a lot of organic matter every year, you really won't need to think about fertilizing plants because the nutrients they need are already in the soil. So where do you get those nutrients? Organic matter that contains nutrients are things like compost, manure, and cover crops. Cover crops can be planted directly at the end of the season and then turned in to introduce a lot of, um, a lot of nutrients into the soil. Just a note that with manure, any kind of manure, you do uh, want to make sure that that is any fresh manure is only applied um, 120 days or more between uh, when application and harvest of any crop. So to get a sense of um, what is in your soil, you really would want to do a soil test. We recommend doing a soil test whenever you're starting a garden. And ideally, you'd want to do a soil test as soon as you possibly can so that you have a sense of what the limitations and strengths of your soil are um, from the get-go. Soil test kits are available at each of the county extension offices, and each um, sample that you're going to want to analyze costs $18. I find that it's really invaluable information to have um, to help you be successful. Some things can be applied in the spring when you get your soil test results back. Um, some of the things that they'll recommend are things that um, can be applied in the spring and might have a pretty fast, um, might not take very long to sort of have uh, an impact in the soil. Other things take a lot longer to sort of change the soil. So the sooner you can test your soil, um, in my mind, the better. Um, and your soil test is gonna tell you about the pH of your soil um, and the major and micronutrients, except nitrogen. It won't um, tell you the amount of nitrogen. Nitrogen is very um, volatile. It's a very volatile compound, and so it, it's not going to give you a measurement of that, but it will give you some recommendations for how much nitrogen. Um, there'll be like general recommendations for how much nitrogen you would want to apply annually. So uh, the next thing to think about is um, just like all of us, plants need water. Um, and a rule of thumb is that they need about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half of water a week. And on average here in Maine, we don't get enough rain for the garden to thrive on rainwater alone. So I would recommend purchasing a rain gauge and checking and emptying it weekly to help you figure out how much water you need to supplement with. As a rule of thumb, uh, you also want to aim for less frequent but deeper watering. Um, so going for five to six inches depth of water when, at any point when you're watering. Um, 
and you want to aim that water at the base of your plants and um, do that early in the day rather than late in the day to avoid having water sitting on the foliage of your plants, which can really encourage um, deep disease. Um, and keep in mind that if you're, you may need to water more frequently or provide more water than that uh, when you're either starting seeds or transplanting plants out into the garden. Or if you have very sandy soil um, or <clears throat> if the conditions have been very hot and or windy. So if watering, there's lots of different ways to water. Um, you might choose to water with watering cans or with a hose. Um, but if that will, if watering by hand will be impractical, you might want to consider installing an irrigation system for your garden. Um, irrigation systems can um, increase the quality of your crops and the yield. We really recommend trickle irrigation um, as the best method if you are going to install irrigation. Kits are available for really any size garden and they can be, um, they do really help with keeping that water at the base of the plant rather than on the foliage. Um, check around online for kits that meet your needs. If you opt for triple, trickle irrigation, just be sure to purchase all of your components from the same supplier because they tend not to be, um, they tend not to work with uh, across systems. <clears throat> Another way to um, sort of build moisture in the soil or keep moisture in the soil is mulch. I, um, can't say enough for keeping your soil covered with really anything. Uh, mulch uh, in really any form is going to be beneficial. Some types of mulch have different benefits and drawbacks. Um, kind of what I look for is something that is readily available, ideally is um, free of weed seeds or has minimal weed seeds. Uh, as well as other factors like whether I'm trying to heat the soil with something like black plastic or landscape fabric, or if I'm trying to improve the amount of organic matter in the soil. So that would be things like um, any of the organic uh, matter will improve your soil. Um, but do avoid anything that is um, very woody. So wood chips, wood shavings, all of those are going to uh, lock up nitrogen in the soil and are not great um, for mulching around your plants. They're okay for um, pathways, walkways, but they shouldn't be near to your plants. All right, so we have fed and watered our plants. Now we want to be sure that we don't allow other things to um, compete with the plants that we're trying to grow. So sometimes, um, sometimes weeds sneak up on us. <laughs> we wonder where they came from. Um, and some places, some uh, usual suspects for where or how we ended up with weeds are from inputs that had weeds in them. So that's things like manure, compost that wasn't um, properly processed. Uh, that's almost always home compost doesn't end up getting hot enough to kill weed seeds. So if you are composting at home, um, I would recommend you don't try to compost any um, weeds that have gone to seed. And also mulch is a, is a, as much as I love mulch, it is, tends to be a source of weed seeds. Um, so that's where some of the weeds, weed seeds may have come in from. Or if you've turned over sod, it's inevitable that there will be, um, you'll have weeds, um, seeds, a seed bank of weeds, um, 
or if you had a really busy year and you just didn't weren't able to keep up with weeding, any of your weeds that um, go to seed or are allowed to spread will present uh, problems for you in the future. So there's kind of a critical time when we want to really be on top of weeding. It's the sort of time when plants are starting to get established um, and are most in need. Their, their roots are really close to the surface still. They haven't um, fully established and they're going to be easily outcompeted by, by weeds that have gotten like a jump start um, in the garden. So once you've sort of passed that weed, critical weed-free period, you can relax a little bit because a lot of plants will kind of compete with, with weeds. Um, but really at the beginning of the season, you do want to um, be very on top of your weeding. So some of the crops that are um, that are able to compete with weeds or suppress weeds are any of the things with big leaves, big growth habits. Um, so your all your squashes, um, beans, corn, potatoes, tomatoes, those all grow large enough that they're sort of able to outcompete weeds. Whereas your um, crops that aren't so great at competing with weeds and really will easily be overtaken by weeds are things like lettuce, carrots, peppers, greens of any kind, onions, um, broccoli and cabbage, and radishes. So some ways to, um, to prevent weeds or to compete with weeds, to keep weeds at bay, are planting densely. If you plant your plants close together so that there's not enough room for weeds to germinate or um, grow, then you can really give your plants uh, a fighting chance against weeds. Um, mulching is also a great technique for uh, suppressing weeds. As long as that mulch doesn't contain tons of weed seeds. Um, so you have to sort of weigh the, the pros and cons of that. Obviously this plastic mulch that you see is not going to introduce weed seeds, but it's also not um, going to introduce any kind of um, beneficial uh, organic matter into the soil. All right, so we've um, prevented weeds from competing with our plants now we want to prevent um, other living things from competing with our plants. Uh, so some principles with, um, with preventing pests or dealing with pests are really observation. I can't say enough for just getting out into the garden and um, keeping a close eye on things over the course of the growing season. Uh, and then just because you've detected a pest or an insect doesn't mean that you need to act immediately. Um, the first thing to do is to get an accurate identification of what it is. Is it a friend? Is it a foe? Um, and if it is a foe, is it actually causing extensive damage to the crop or is the damage superficial? Sometimes um, an insect will be eating holes in the leaves of something like broccoli, but I'm not planning to eat the leaves of the broccoli, and so I just leave it be. Um, extension can be a great resource for helping you identify insects in your garden, as can um, different bug identification apps. Um, there's great apps out there that you can download onto your phone, take a picture, and um, find out what it is that's in your garden. Um, and I have that, uh, I've installed some of those on my phone and found that I have a lot more beneficial insects than I um, had realized. So it's kind of a fun thing to um, have. But if you do end up with problematic pests, 
that are damaging your crops. Um, some things to uh, kind of think about uh, for the future would be to keep good records of what you had, when you had it, and how bad it became. So next year you can either opt for later or earlier planting, covering with floating row cover, and or rotating those crops. Um, sometimes people want to run out and buy a can of insecticide and um, you know spray the heck out of whatever it is, but it's a good idea to stop and evaluate the cost benefit. Is this um, is this if you're going to apply something, is it going to save the plant? Um, and then what is the value of the plant versus the cost of the treatment? Will the impact be uh, what will the impact be to other things in the garden, things like beneficial insects? Um, so you have to sort of weigh all of that when deciding, you know, what to do when you find a pest in your garden. Um, so, as I said, uh, one of the things I've had the most luck with are... Um, creating barriers, physical barriers for insects with, um, with uh, covers. And those really need to go on early in the season. They're, they're not super helpful at preventing damage once you already have pests in the garden. Um, so they do need to go in right from, right from the get-go, but they are great at um, preventing insect damage. Some other um, approaches to controlling pests uh, are selecting a, a site um, with, in, with pests in mind, um, rotating your crops, making sure to remove the plant debris at the end of the season. You can hand pick insects into a container of soapy water, in the, especially in the early morning when they're less um, active. You can use those row covers that we just looked at. Um, also thinking about crop selection. Maybe you opt not to grow something because you just have um, a lot of issues with pests. Uh, and then you can also sort of play around with the um, planting dates. So sometimes you can sort of trick your um, the pests that might be around in your garden by planting things either earlier or later than you typically would to um, avoid to avoid the life cycle when the pest is um, eating the most in the garden. Um, and then there's also some other things you can think about like encouraging beneficials or um, different traps that uh, I think of like squash, um, striped squash beetles as being something that there's traps that are relatively effective for. Um, so next up are keeping our plants from becoming sick. So diseases are a reality. They can be very, very problematic in the garden. Um, and so some things to think about when preventing disease other than um, using fungicides would be uh, implementing a rotation strategy. So really thinking about planting and families in your garden, keeping um, things in the same family, in the same um, area, and not planting those every three years in the same spot. Making sure that you have clean um, seed, you're, you're um, purchasing from reputable um, places for your seeds or plant material. Like um, I think of garlic, garlic is something that can harbor some um, diseases that last for a very long time in the garden. So just making sure that you're starting with, um, with seed or plant material from a source that guarantees it to be disease-free. 
Ensuring good air circulation between plants will help minimize disease. That means allowing an, a proper spacing between plants. Um, I, one of my um, shortcomings as a gardener is that I'm always trying to squeeze in that last one more tomato plant. And when, when grown too close together, things really do have a tendency to um, become diseased more easily and then spread disease to other plants. Uh, additionally, um, staking plants, uh, plants that uh, tend to grow in a big sprawly kind of manner, like tomatoes, are, are best if they're staked instead of al allowed to just sort of sprawl all over the place. And then trying to minimize um, any water on your plants, which can foster the growth of spores. Minimizing pests and weeds is another way to help reduce the spread of disease. Um, some people find that growing in raised beds can encourage uh, better air circulation and drainage, and um, that growing in a raised bed might um, result in fewer weeds, and all of that can also help to prevent um, disease in your garden. If you do suspect that a plant has a disease, you can take some pictures and contact your local extension office to help you with identification and control options. Um, and if it ends up that you do have diseased plants in your garden, it's really important to make sure that you remove those plants and throw them away uh, or burn them because diseases can overwinter in plant de debris and wreak havoc, havoc in your garden for years to come. Composting diseased plants is really not recommended because those diseases can stay um, dormant in your compost pile and then resurface when you um, introduce that compost into the garden. All right, so last but not least, keep an eye on the big picture. We really don't wanna forget that gardening is supposed to be relaxing and fun and if it becomes a chore or a stressor, you really aren't likely to want to do it again in the future. So I would really recommend starting small and try to learn from what went well and what didn't go so well. Be sure to keep a garden journal so you can remember what pests you had in, in your garden and when, what varieties did well and what didn't, what did you eat and what did you not eat. Uh, and so, and that's my advice for getting started with a garden. Just a quick recap. Um, we want to give our plants a fighting ch chance from the start, and that includes um, choosing the best spot for them, choosing the right plants, plants that will grow well with the conditions that we have, making sure that our plants are, um, have the nutrients that they need, the water that they need, and that they're not competing with other um, weeds that are going to prevent them from um, thriving. We also wanna make sure that um, we don't allow pests to eat our crops. We're not growing for the bugs, we're growing for ourselves. So um, avoiding pests uh, is the ideal scenario and disease as well, trying to make sure that we do what we can to prevent um, disease in the garden and keeping an eye at the end of the day on the big picture and why, why we're um, gardening in the first place. So if you end up with too much at the end of your growing season of a good thing, um, please consider uh, if you live in Waldo County, checking out one of the um, Waldo County Bounty give and take tables. This is a way for you to share your bounty with people in need in your community. Um, so that's a great way if you end up with a big bumper crop of green beans um, to share those with folks who might need them. There are, I think, uh, two or three tables in Belfast. Uh, and so last but not least are my resources for you to check out. Um, if, if you're really, um, Excited to get into gardening. I can't say enough for the Victory Gardens for Me video series that um, Extension created last year. 
a link to that on there, as well as tons of other resources. So uh, happy gardening, and thanks again for um, having me speak. And I'll um, turn it back over to Margaret for questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Binya. That was great. And uh, um, if you haven't, if people haven't put um, their questions in the chat box, now is a good time for you to do that. Okay. Starting at the beginning, Wendy asks, we may be gardeners, but not very good at it. I guess that was not a question, just a comment. Um, let's see. Charlie asked, my locust tree, tree's roots go through the entire garden, about twice the area below the crown of the trees. And that, again, is, is just a comment. I don't know, Vinya, if you have a remark about that. Yeah, I, I mean, it really is, um, it's going to be really difficult to do any kind of in-ground gardening where there are tree roots. Um, you might be able to put some raised beds in somewhere where, where the tree roots extend if you're able to get enough um, sunlight, if it's not, you know, shaded for more than that, um, you know, four to six hours if you're going to do some cool season things. Yeah. Uh, Corliss says, why is it that we work so hard to increase the organic matter in our uh, raised beds, but soilless media are fine for containers, no need to fertilize? So soilless mixes will have, um, will have uh, fertilizers in them. They'll have, uh, you know, sort of the... Um, all the nutrients a plant needs. The drawback to that is, you know, you're having to replace that every year. It's not as, um, it's not as much of a, um, uh, the nutrients in your in-ground garden you're really creating an ecosystem. You don't get that ecosystem in um, container mixes, but you know you do have um, fertilizers in there that will feed the plants. Okay. Um, Wendy asks, what are your thoughts on containers that are metal and galvanized for growing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I got a question like this sort of recently. Someone was sort of concerned about um, galvanized metals leaching. And I did a little bit of research into that and found that um, really is not, uh, it's not an issue. I actually have galvanized metal and galvanized steel as the, um, as the containers in my garden. Um, the sides of my garden and and the benefits I think to those are that um, that they don't they're not going to break down as quickly. I'm banking on having those raised beds for a good solid uh, ten to fifteen years versus wood, which would um, which would rot after a few years and need to be replaced. Um, so Charlie. Um mentions that the cooperative extension has a terrific simple design for constructing um, one's own seed starting stand so just thanks for that plug charlie um <laughs> i will admit that i uh constructed that said stand with um with a group once and i probably shouldn't admit this while it's being recorded but I found it to be uh, a little rickety, I, I have to admit. Um, so what I have opted for at home is uh, kind of like an inexpensive wire, um, that wire shelving you can get where you have adjustable shelves has worked really well for me for a seedling stand. Um, you know, they run like under $100, which compared to to an actual like seedling. Um, if you were to buy a seedling stand, those are um, very, very pricey. 
Um, so I have metal shelving, wire shelving, which allows me to hang some shop lights from each shelf, two shop lights to a shelf, um, and um, adjust the chains up and down to allow me to have the lights either closer or further away from, um, from the plants. So thank you, Charlie, for that, for that uh, plug for Maybe somebody else will have will have more luck. Maybe it was operator error in the construction of it. I don't know. Um, Wendy says, um, since foliage gets wet in the rain, why is it advantageous to water the soil rather than the foliage? Um, so any water that's sitting on your plants is just a vector for it's it's a environment that's really friendly for spore development and, and disease. Um, there's nothing that we can really do about the rain that will, you know, if we have a lot of rain, um, we will sometimes see like big uh, spikes in disease following um, a long period of rain. Um, it's another reason why it's a good idea to mulch under the plants is to keep because um, it's not it's not always the rain itself or the water itself. It's the um, splashback from the soil getting onto the leaves. Um, so if you mulch under your plants, that will help to minimize any any um, splashing of soil onto the leaves of the plants. Um, so, so uh, Vinya, I ask um, how you have to treat seaweed before using it for mulch. Um, so seaweed generally, if you're um, if you're going and, you know, getting seaweed from, um, you know, from a local beach, you're going to find that there's been enough rain to sort of like wash this, you know, we, I don't, there's not a lot of issue with, I think the concern there is salt, right? That you're going to end up with bringing salt into the garden, but I've really found that seaweed, um, after, a good rain, um, it's not, it doesn't end up being a problem. I like seaweed a lot because it brings a lot of micronutrients to the garden. Um, but I will say that uh, one of the biggest challenges that I have had with seaweed is that um, along the sort of buffer zone between the beach and the dune or the woods or whatever is behind it, there are some very, very, uh, <laughs> Uh, robust seeds, very robust plants grow in that zone. And so their seeds do tend to be pretty problematic in the garden. Um, so you, even though, you know, I, I never really thought about seaweed bringing in a bunch of, of weed seeds, but they do. Um, so okay. just sort of beware, apply it thickly. Um, and I tend to apply it as a mulch it, when I'm going into winter versus like on my live plants. Okay. Um, any, Susan asks, any recommendation for controlling cabbage flea beetles? Cabbage flea beetles? Um, so, you know, flea beetles are one of those, uh, one of those insects that I personally have found that they they can be they can be problematic certainly but if it's a crop that you're growing um not for the leaves they do tend to mostly impact the leaves um uh but covering this would be one of those ones where covering with reme um can help if you do it you know before they arrive um, but you can really end up just trapping them under the, that's that land, that's that, that fabric that you would, um, sort of tent your plants with. Um, it can tend to mask the issue if you, um, have your plants covered, um, and you're not looking underneath and noticing that you have flea beetles. They can also tend to get, so this is not a good answer. I'm, I would have to, um, look that up for you. I have a, I have a feeling it would end up being, um, you would need to maybe consider 
either rotating or skipping that crop for a, for a season or um, applying a, an insecticide. So feel free to follow up with me um, after, after today and I can send you a publication on those um, specifically. Uh, Wendy asks, is there any way of controlling those snails that attack bean plants? Uh, snails. Um, again, feel free to follow up with me. I'll, I'll send you a publication on, um, on control for those. Um, you know, the main thing with slugs and snails is, um, kind of, it's kind of opposite to a lot of the recommendations that I just gave. Um, uh, it's like trying to keep the, the soil as open and clear as possible. So not having anything that creates um, shade of any kind, any debris, any logs, any, um, you know, really anything that they can get a little bit of shade from is going to um, be a friendly, create a friendly environment for slugs and snails. Okay. Barb asks, which bugs are beneficial? Oh, Barb, there's so many wonderful beneficials. Thank you. Uh, so I found, I almost put it in the slide presentation. I, I wish that I had. I found a, a tachinid fly last year in my garden. Uh, crazy looking fly, very like hairy. Ha I can't remember. Um, and, you know, at first I didn't know what it was. I didn't like the looks of it, <laughs> but I found out that it um its life cycle is to lay uh, its eggs in um, Japanese beetles, and as the eggs hatch, they um they're they're like they bore into the Japanese beetle and um and kill them. Uh, so that's just like one example. Um, there are some parasitic wasps that are beneficials. Uh, ladybugs are beneficials. Um, there's, uh, I can't think of any others off the top of my head, but, um, but there are a number of, of things that are either beneficial or really, um, sort of neutral. I found last year, I spent a lot more time in my garden last year, it turns out because, you know, our offices were closed. Um, and so I, I had a lot more chance to sort of observe things and, um, and find out about what was there. And I was surprised to find a lot of things that were sort of neither um, beneficial or harmful. Um, so there's kind of, you know, you're, again, you're creating an ecosystem. So there's something of everything. Um, yeah, I just, I just comment, I, I linked a great video from uh, Lucas Ohio State on beneficials and uh, habitats to encourage them. Beautiful, thank and you. And the tachinid fly is, is, is in there. Cool, cool. Um, Susan says, I plant potatoes after June 15th, which pretty much eliminates problems with Colorado potato beetle. So you must have a pretty late, your frost must come pretty late. Uh, but that's exactly what I'm, what I was talking about with, um, you know, planting either earlier or later to, to kind of a, um, to trick the pests is if you can sort of either get ahead of or behind their life cycle is pretty fixed or when they arrive is relatively fixed. So that's a good example of, um, of how to, how to do that in real life. Um, Charlie says, um, he makes the comment, plus row orientation with prevailing wind helps. And I think he's talking about uh, cutting down on pests there. I think that's what he's talking about, but I'll continue. Um, Marge, what what do you think about planter bags that seem to be popular? Yeah, I've been doing some of those. Um, so those are like, 
I wish I had one here for folks who are, have never seen them. It's basically just a container that's made out of um, sometimes a recycled material that's like a fabric. Um, they're really nice because they do have great drainage. Um, they are pretty like easy to move around if you find that you've um, you know you've planted some plants in it and you have it in a spot that's getting too much shade or it's getting um, whatever the issue may be you can pick it up and just move it to somewhere else um, I've been using those with uh, with young families who are getting into garden uh, gardening as like an introductory way to get get into gardening um, so I like them a lot they're reusable pretty readily re reusable um, you know I mean the drawbacks to container gardening are really that you do need to start with new um, planting mix every year so that can get a little bit um, pricey um, Christine asked for suggestions for deers eating the garden besides fences. Uh, yeah, they're, they're really problematic. Um, uh, you know, there are some plant, some things that are, um, less palatable to deer. Uh, they, most of those things tend to not be, um, vegetables. It, it's more, um, I'm thinking more along the lines of, um, perennials and non-vegetable things that they don't love. Um, we had a good article, uh, years ago in, in our main home garden news about, uh, deer, deer control, but I mean, Really, really fencing is unfortunately one of the only ways um, to effectively manage deer. Um, I mean, co like covering with Rime is also, you know, I, I have, um, they, they're not gonna, they're not gonna get into the, into the Rime, but that only works for certain crops. Um, it's, you can't really cover with, um, with Rime or Agrabon or any of those um, cloths, uh, things like tomatoes or um, some of your warmer season things. So it is, it's, uh, they're, they're tricky. Um, Barb suggests the garden club set up a table to give away produce, which is a great idea. Um, and then Marge asked for tips for growing great radishes uh you can just come to my house and i'll give you all my radishes <laughs> sorry um tips for growing great radishes so <clears throat> um radishes i find radishes are usually fairly easy i wonder if um what sorts of challenges you've had with growing them would be my question i think um, uh, I like to grow radishes or sort of, um, rather than growing them in rows, I tend to grow radishes, um, in blocks. I'll grow them between other crops where I want to fill an area really quickly to cover the soil, um, as sort of almost like a, um, an edible cover crop while I have something else in the ground, um, but they do have a tendency to um, to bolt. That that's one of the challenges with them. They do sometimes tend to bolt if they're grown in the heat in the um, hot, hotter part of the summer. So, you know, starting them early. Um, but I'd be curious to know what Marge's uh, challenges have been to to better answer her question. Um. Apparently, Pat sent her questions directly to you, Vinya, um, rather than to everyone. So I don't, I don't have them. You would have them in your 
um, in your chat. Okay. Do you want to look at them now and answer them? Or do you want to get back to them? Oh, I see that there's, yeah. Um, so can you say again? Uh, so somebody asked about seaweed straight from the beach. I think we talked a little bit about seaweed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's from Pat Blakesley. She sent questions privately to you. Oh yeah, about collecting seaweed. As far as I know from the high tide line, um, it is fine to collect seaweed. Um, you don't want to harvest seaweed from, that's like connected to anything. Um, seaweed that's, you know, on, on rocks or um, on pilings or anything like that is still alive. But um, there is nothing to prevent anyone from, um, from going and collecting seaweed from a public um, beach. I do, you know, I do find that, uh, that you want to kind of go at certain, you may need to go multiple times, um, to, to it, there, there's my, what I found is there isn't always an adequate enough supply of seaweed to really warrant like collecting it where I go. Um, so I, tend to go like after a winter storm and ideally after it has rained so that it has been, um, you know, at least rinsed a little bit. Um, I hope that answers that Great. question. Um, Kirk asked for the best seed sources and suggestions for finding cedar planks for raised beds. Um, so there's lots of good sources out there for seeds. Um, uh, you know, we tend to try to sort of um, say an extension that we don't uh, endorse or, you know, that we don't mean to endorse or not endorse any particular company um, or product. Uh, but some of the, you know, seed sources here in Maine are obviously um, Johnny's Selected Seeds is a, is a popular one. Um, Fedco is another uh, good source. I mean, there's like a zillion different, it sort of depends on what it is that you're looking for. Um, uh, in, in terms of, are you looking for, do you care if they're hybrid or are you looking for, um, you know, heirloom varieties? Um, uh, high mowing is another one that I think of that's sort of regional that I like. I like the Fedco Johnny's um, and uh, high mowing because they do cater a little bit to the Northeast. They do tend to have varieties that do well in the Northeast, but really um, there's no shortage of, um, of seed, seed sources. And I mean, I would crowdsource that one to um, have people put in the chat what their favorite uh, seed seed source is. Um, and in terms of the in terms of the lumber, I would I um, somebody already put Viking put put a plug in there for Viking. Um, and I again not to uh, endorse any particular company, but I have bought um, uh, Eastern cedar from from Viking in the past and been happy with them. Um, uh, I will say that this year I've heard that lumber is like two or three times more expensive than in other years because of supply issues. Um, so. Um, Venia, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's 1.15 and I wonder if maybe we need to wind this up there some is there some final best way for people to get in touch with you with further questions yeah um so right here on the resources slide um my whoops just kidding <laughs> um is my email address uh and that really is for me the best way to be in touch but um you can also call my office um or if you happen to be in a different 
um, place, you can look up your um, closest extension office to get support. Uh, okay. There was Charlie, just I'd, I'd like to finish with this and point this out to everybody because it's in your chat box. But he gives us a, a YouTube, a, a, that YouTube uh, URL for the beneficial insects. So that's something that will be interesting to all of us. And thank you, Venia. This was great. And many thanks to the library and, of course, to Brenda. And I just want to add that the Garden Club will be offering a virtual program on monarchs, milkweeds, and migration presented by um, Serene Slagonia, Slagona, <laughs> I apologize, on April 20th at noon. You can register for this program at BelfastGardenClub.org.